Well, hello and welcome to my kitchen in Rutland. And um, we're back with the, the Preserving School and uh, today we're going to be making and talking and looking at ideas for making fruit cordials. Mainly tonight, uh, berries, uh, but these can be adapted. Uh, but first, before I start that, I just want to mention our latest magazine, Simply Preserved. So online at lovejars.co.uk, you can read it for free, page turning software, you can copy pages, download recipes. Uh, it's all, it's absolutely so pretty this month. It's all about edible flowers. What's not to like? But best of all, uh, 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 here we have our own Graziella with her article, her feature, on her life in Brazil. So well done, Graziella. I loved reading it. And there's plenty of pictures, there's everything she's been doing. So if any of you fancy writing for the magazine, just drop me a line and I'll tell you what needs to be done. Um, there she is there. So well done. And we've got some beautiful things in here. The um, edible botanist telling us all about how to preserve flowers to use. You don't have to preserve them. I mean, you, you can use them fresh, you can crystallize them, you can dry them, um, all sorts of ideas in there. So have a look and have a read, grab a cup of coffee and there's other puzzles and things on orchards and everything else. But coming up in July is our very own festival, our uh, stay at home jam festival, where you can take part online in our Facebook group, preserve it wherever you are. You can send in, there's, there's daily competitions throughout the week to celebrate National uh, Preserving Awareness Week. So you can go on there, you can enter the competitions, people uh, vote by liking your entry, and then we have little prizes each day for. I mean, they're not mad, madly, <laughs> they are preserving related, but it's sort of nothing um, too grand, I'm afraid. But it's a bit of fun and we have a weekly jamometer. So if you are making at home every day, you can send in how many jars you've made and we add it to the jamometer. And I think last week, the last week, last year, which was the first week in actual fact, uh, we made over 5,000 jars, I think, between us over the week. The first day is a jam making marathon. So I'll be doing a live jam making class and then people can make at home during the day and again, send in how many jars they've made to add in to the jamometer. So lots of things to read in there. Please do and tell your friends so they can read as well. This is yummy berry butter. So this is using the berries of the season, mixed it into butter with a little bit of uh, icing sugar and then um, rolled into a sausage, sliced and then frozen. And then you can take out what they call a coin. Um, I've made a stack here of um, uh, scotch pancakes, the thick pancakes, and some berry butter on the top melted over and it's absolutely delicious. So that's one online now, which you can be having a look at. So let's talk uh, cordials, um, berry cordials. Now we la the last workshop uh, I last year, not last year, last term was the jam, I believe, that kind of jam. I hope some of you've had a go at it and perhaps found some of the tips useful. Um, and now we talked then about the, the, what you need to make great jam and the importance of having really fresh fruit with the maximum amount of pectin in it because it's got the most pectin just before it's ready to be picked. And that's when you want to sort of home in on getting your jam fruit, that sort of period in the uh, fruit's life 
but sometimes you know we get gifted or you know we've perhaps been away overnight and the fruit in the garden is too ripe or you see a bargain on the market you know where they, they often have sort of um, bowls of things that they sell off cheaply at the end and it's not really great for jam and it will be disappointing it will be hard work you know you can't just go home put it in the pan and 15 minutes later you've got some jam it would you're going to have to kind of juggle it to make it make it uh, set but the ideal thing for that kind of fruit the overripe fruit the slightly um shall i say squishy fruit uh, not i don't mean bruised and moldy i just mean softer and not you know ripe for um jam is to make cordial with it because it doesn't need to set you've got all of the flavor and in a way it's slightly sweeter naturally sweeter because the sugars have developed as it's more mature so you can make some great uh, cordials with that kind of fruit so bear that in mind you know just don't just think jam 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 so that's what we're going to be doing tonight is making a, I'm making a mixed berry fruit because I've raided my freezer and got some you know bags of ends of things and, and mix them together frankly because that's another thing that's useful to do you don't have to just make a single variety um, you know you can mix and match you can try out different flavors together and you know you'll find something you love probably by accident. Um, but I just want to go back to earlier in the year, we made the citrus cordials first with all the citrus fruits. And then uh, we supposedly made the elderflower cordial, but they weren't out. So I, I made primrose cordial for you. But the elderflowers now are absolutely fantastic in the UK. Um, uh, loaded and absolutely loaded with flowers. And they're so heavy with pollen and, and they're so big where they've been waiting and waiting you remember I said in April when we usually have our first flowers out, they were still sort of tight and they've stayed like that all the way through until now. And when I pick them, they're absolutely covered in pollen and my hands are all yellow. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's the beautiful flower. It is absolutely magical really that that can grow and be so so useful we went through all the uses of the elder tree and its properties and this is the beginning this is the start of it and the flowers there and if Trev zooms right in you can probably see the yellow sort of center and the dusting of pollen on there and uh, that's what makes the if you're going to make elderflower fizz that's what it, where all the natural yeasts are I don't recommend you make the elderflower fizz. You, I know I went all through that. Um, it's much better to make the cordial and add the fizz to it, like Prosecco or sparkling mineral water. Um, I wouldn't go so far as adding champagne because, you know, <laughs> I'd rather drink the champagne as it is. But those are the flowers. And you can see in this little bowl what I've done this year for the first time ever, because I've never been organised enough, um, I've picked, I had the whole table covered in kitchen paper and them all laid out with the head like that, upside down. I didn't have leaves on it, just the stalk up in the air and all the flowers. And I left them there for a couple of days and now they're all beautifully dried in my little dish here. If you think the whole table was covered with them and that's what I've ended up with, but I'll probably do some more. And they're going to be useful later in the year. And I'm going to try later on to make some um, moisturizer with them, with its the um, the flowers, uh, the dried flowers. I've been meaning to make it for years and years and just haven't got around to it. So, and of course, I've made my cordial. I've got three little bottles here. I haven't made a lot of it because actually I don't particularly like it so and Trev certainly doesn't like it so there's no point making a lot but I've made these three and so when we do the berry cordial in a bit I'm going to sterilize them all together to save a job later on so we did catch up with the elder the elder flowers in the end so uh the cordial you might wonder what big blue is doing here 
And I'm going to take this off now and I'll tell you why it's there in the first place. And I want to make sure I don't catch anything. But this is my uh, jelly bag stand with the bag there and the fruit. Now that might look like I was trying to sort of, you know, ta-da, and it's not that at all. It's a practical thing. This time of year, we get masses of fruit flies if you don't cover anything like this. And when you've got this set up, it's quite hard to cover it. So I use uh, either a bin bag or the biggest uh, bag that I can find just to um, stop the wretched fruit flies getting at it. Otherwise, they're all buzzing around it. They're only tiny, but you know, you don't want those in your cordial, do you? So, but you can see, sorry, Trev, can you get the camera again? It's been here for nearly 24 hours, but there's still a drip there underneath. <laughs> but I've got all, I've, I, what I did as per the recipe, I cooked down the fruit and let it cool a bit and then I put it into my jelly bag and it was quite a quite a lot in the pan and this is the juice that's come out naturally there it is, it's just dripped again <laughs> and this is the fruit that's left the pulp so uh, if I was feeling energetic I would probably uh, and if there was a bit more of it I put that through a sieve and then I would use it as a fruit leather in the dehydrator, but I'm not sure I'm quite up to that today. But what we're after is the juice. You can, of course, use the jelly bag on a hook, on a cupboard door, in your jug underneath. I find it's best to uh, let it drip straight into a jug because you've got to measure it anyway. So if you put it into a bowl, then you've got to tip it into a jug and it's all the time you're losing the juice. It might only be small, but it just is easier and less washing up if you get yourself a nice big measuring jug and drip it straight into there. I like the jelly bag stand very much. Uh, this is a new product to us. We've had it made by um, a chap I met on Twitter, actually, he's got a young family. He stays at home, looks after the children. His name's Kev, and he is a carpenter by trade, and his wife is a teacher. So he looks after the children during, during the day when they're not at school. And uh, so I love this design, and we used to sell them years ago, but we couldn't then buy them. They, they, was, they stopped being made. So I asked him if he would consider making a kit for us, which he's very kindly done. And this is my first outing for it with the new one. I used to have one ages ago and I probably lent it to somebody and of course it's disappeared. But what I like about it is it's nice and stable. You can fill it easily. And then when you're done, you can fold it up and stand it somewhere out of the way. And you haven't got a, the plastic ones, kind of buckle on when the ones that sort of stand around the top of a, a bowl, I find they don't take the weight of the fruit very well. Perhaps not berries, but once you get up to heavier fruits, it's, it's a bit, you know, is it going to be all right? And the metal ones that you have to all screw together, they just rust. I mean, they're only made of sort of cheap metal. You have to screw all the legs in and fit that on and, and then they after after a while they rust and and that's not very hygienic really so I like the wooden ones you know it, if it ain't broke don't fix it sort of thing um, and so um, I'm absolutely delighted to get my hands on these again so I'm just oh sorry there's a question I forgot to look at those uh, yeah okay Rachel Williams, uh, yeah. Rachel, you can use a sieve lined with um, muslin or something fine, some fine fabric. Don't, it needs to be uh, fine, but open like the um, 
jelly bag in a way. If it's too thick, you'll be there forever trying to get the fruit through. If you're not too fussed, you could just put the fruit through a sieve, but don't press it down because you'll get pulp and bits through it as well. So uh, yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, <laughs> tights are good. Um, yeah, that's a good idea actually, because it's about the right thickness and um, you know density. You, you want a sort of um, fineness, but, but it needs to let the juice go through and leave all the pulp behind. I'm just looking for a bowl. I'll probably have to ask Trev to look for a bowl so I can put this into the, um, Oh no, it's all right, I can use, no I can't, I can't use that one. So I can take the jelly bag off and uh, put it to one side. I will just do this. Oh. It's all pristine when it, you first have it, and then it looks like a bit of a massacre after a few uses. So I'll put that in there. That will be taken away, and then I can just hold that flat, and it uh, can go in, well, in my case, it will go in the pantry, but you know, it's quite easy to store on top of a cupboard or something, you know, it's not um, difficult. So, um, I now need to look at how much juice we've got, which is 800 ml. Now, don't get worried because you won't have that much because I haven't really followed the recipe. And to be honest, you don't need to follow the recipe either. Um, whatever fruit you've got, cook it. You don't need to put water with it. Just cook it on a low heat to start with, let the juices run like we did with the jam. And especially if like me, you've used frozen fruit, it's a bit wet anyway. So just let it cook down. And I cooked mine for about 45 minutes, something like that. But it depends on the fruit, um, honestly. But you can just cook any amount of fruit as long as you measure the juice. And then when you come to add the sugar, it's not like jam. You don't want equal sugar to fruit because you will end up setting the juice. When you pour it into the bottles, it will set and you will not be able to use it. Will it be like a jelly, like a set jelly like we're going to make next week? So you don't want that because A, you can't get it out of the bottle and B, it won't uh, dilute. I can say this confidently <laughs> from experience, not my, not my own personal experience, but I used to have a lady that used to help me when I had um, uh, quite a big preserving business and she used to, to come and help me and make things. And she made a batch of the, the tall cordial bottles and it probably covered half the size of this table. And she made black currant cordial and it all set in the bottle. <laughs> We couldn't use any of it. So do be careful. It's You don't have to measure it, you know, super accurately, but make sure you've got about two thirds sugar to the whole amount of the fruit juice, and then you won't be in danger of setting it. So what I'm going to do is to measure that sugar that I need. The recipe gives guidance for you of the, of the ratio. So, um, you know, don't feel afraid of it. And you can use a little bit less than the recipe says if you want to, but don't go too low because as ever, the sugar is your preservative. And if you don't put enough in, um, you're not going to preserve the um, cordial. So I've got some sugar in here. It's just white granulated, nothing special, no, nothing expensive or, and I'm going to put 800, I'm going to put about 550, I think, in there. And I'm going to put that into my pan. And I'm going to pour in my 
juice. But this will be switched on at the wall, I hope so. Otherwise, I'll be waiting and waiting. And look at the colour of this juice. This was a mixture of some blackberries that I had from last year, some raspberries. Um, there was another red fruit and uh, there's some black currants, I think, it was in there as well. It was all just sort of ends of bags, really. And this is the beauty of this. You can, you know, it doesn't have to be anything special. You can just use what you've got. Or a fresh fruit is fine. You know, if you bought a bargain or got some loads of fruit in the garden or a friend's got an allotment or, you know, just horses for courses, really. Um, so there's our fruit. I've got my spoon. And now, again, you can hear the sugar. You've got to try and get the sugar to dissolve. What I'm not going to do is boil it, again, because I don't want any risk of it setting. And if you've got things like currants in it, red currants, that kind of thing, they, they're, um, they've got so much pectin, you know, you can't, you've got to be careful with them that they don't go and set it when you don't want them to. So it smells amazing. Get my mat ready. It's not quite the same issue as with jam, that you've got to have every little last bit dissolved, even if you pour it into the bottles and you don't think it's thoroughly dissolved. When we do the water bathing, that heat will melt the rest of it in the bottle. So um, you can see the delicious colour. Now, if you want to make um, just a plain black currant one, it may, is a fantastic uh, drink for children, for, you know, vitamins and so on. But it's also fantastic as an adult drink, as Cur Royale with some white wine or, um, again, the Prosecco. And this is great, a great colour as well. So you see it's smoothing out. Not quite so much uh, grittiness. Now, if you want to make your cordial from other fruits, go ahead. You know, it's just cook your fruits. I know Karis has got a lot of rhubarb to do. You can do rhubarb. She's going to mix some raspberries with it, which is delicious. You could try putting a bit of mint in it, Karis. And that's a lovely flavour. The, the um, raspberry and mint together is delicious. So I'm sure it, the rhubarb would uh, it would go well with the rhubarb as well. Uh, you can do rhubarb and orange, rhubarb and ginger. It depends. You know, just do two or three bottles of different ones because it depends when you open it and want to drink it as to how you feel about what the um, tastes are. You can do all the berry ones in the summer. You can go through to the autumn and do plum, plum and ginger, plum, plum and cinnamon. Um, you've got the gauges, all the different gauges, the green gauges and all that kind of thing. Uh, and blackberries, of course, blackberry, uh, an apple and um, all good stuff. So just follow what I've said, you just cook the fruit that you've got down. I mean, if you've got something like uh, apple or rhubarb, again, you'll need about a teacup full of water probably, just so it doesn't stick to the pan <clears throat> because you don't want that. And the plums, I mean, it won't make any difference to the, the end result. Because um, again, it's not like jam where you don't want to add any moisture because you're not, you're not trying to achieve a set. So just cook down the fruit until it's soft. And our girls around the world in, in America and Brazil, you're going to have a, you're going to have fabulous fruits you can choose from, you know, peaches and mangoes and pineapple and all that kind of thing. So you just go for it. You know, it's um, whatever you've got locally and whatever is in season and whatever is economic and uh, you'll be good to go. 
So that's nice and smooth now. And the uh, sugar appears to be dissolved. I can't feel it and I can't hear it. So rather than cooking it and boiling it and all that kind of thing, I'm just going to, it's just heating. And what I'm going to do is bottle it and then I'm going to sterilize it in the bottle. So I don't want to cook it to death before I do that um, because it, you know, it's going to lose flavor. It's going to lose color. It's going to lose any sort of vitamins that it's got in it, you know, vitamin C and that kind of thing. So I've got my bottles here. Mine are cold, but you can heat yours in the oven as the recipe says. It's just that I don't want the oven on while we're filming and to be running around in the kitchen trying to gather everything together. But um, this is just for me, so don't, you know, there's no um, worry about it. Now, where's my final wood? Oh, there it is. I've got my ladle. Any foam on the top will, I hope, dissipate. I mean, it's only sugar from the sugar, so if it doesn't, it's not a great big issue. Um, so what I'm going to do is lift that pan off. And I'm going to put my pan of water on that I'm going to use to water bath it in a minute. So we get our funnel. I, if you find it easier, you know, and, you, and you're careful, you can pour this back into your jug and pour it into the bottles but you know how sort of cat candid I am so it's better for me to just uh, ladle it in uh, so Brenda's asking about all right now let's go from the top Uh, good to hear about the mangoes. I have some of those in my fridge. Good. <laughs> that's great, Rachel. Yeah, well, that's the thing, you know. And sometimes you could just make two or three bottles of this and then you build up a sort of stock of, of different flavours. And if you've got little ones around or, you know, you're a grandparent, it's great to have something to offer them that they've not really had before, perhaps. So... Uh, we don't sell this funnel anymore, I'm afraid. We used to, but we haven't got any left. And the trouble is we have to have, well, <laughs> it seems like thousands of them made. And uh, I do do a collapsible one, which is slightly thinner, uh, which folds flat and goes in your drawer nicely. So that's an option. But this is one I've had for years. So just fill it to about half an inch or five centimeters from the top. And then there was, uh, I'm not going to skim the foam now because it will die down and um, you know, it's just all fruit and flavor going in the bin as far as I'm concerned. I mean, if I was going to sell this batch, I might be a bit more fussy, but I'm not. So I'm quite happy to, to leave it be, I'm afraid. Uh, so let's get this into the bottle and the red fruits especially do create foam I don't know why it's just their chemical makeup I suppose reacting with the fruit I'm going to use my bigger ladle because we're going to be here all night with this right now I should tip it all over the table, you see. <laughs> I love the, um, what's called the beaner one, the, like Ribena, the black currant. I just adore that. I love black currants. And I'm still eating my black currant jam from last term. I have it every morning on my toast. Think about you all as I'm doing so. So uh, what I'm going to do is my lid, I'm just going to put it onto the thread and I'm not going to do it up. 
So it's just going to go in like that into the pan. I think little and often is the key with this. And apart from dripping it overnight, it takes about 10 minutes. So you can soon um, use up fruit that's perhaps ripened quicker than you thought and uh, not waste it and make something lovely. Yeah, I'm nearly at the bottom of my pan. Don't worry about the sugar in this because by the time it's diluted, it's diluted. <laughs> so, um, you know, you do it. It's not like you're drinking it neat. And then the last little bit, I'm going to just tip into this bottle so I can enjoy that in the week. So I'm going to put those in there, tip this. Yeah, I told you I'd get it all over the table. I won't bother to sterilise that last one because um, I'm going to be drinking that later on with my fizzy water. So I'll put the cap on. Uh, so Rachel's asking, are there fruits that aren't any good for cordial? I noted you said soft fruit in the recipe. I'm guessing apples don't count. Well, no, you can cook it. You can cook anything down to make the cordial. It's just I'm, I've specified soft fruit at this time of the year because that's the season in the UK that we're going into. But whatever you fruit you've got, treat it accordingly. So apple, as it happens, is not great on its own. You don't often see apple jam, for instance. It's used to partner other fruits. And it mostly in this country, it's part, partners blackberries. Um, or you could put it with other, other fruits as well. But on its own, as a diluted ingredient, it's not that flavorful, funnily enough. What I do with apple is I juice it. And I'll be talking about that in a minute. So um, you've got to kind of assess what you've got and the best way to use it and to be honest they're not not always that juicy uh cooking apples maybe but eating apples are not you don't get that much juice from them so really what we're about here is getting the juice and um you know using it appropriately i'll just clear the decks a bit because i've got some other kit so now I've got this on quite high. I'm going to put my elderberry, my elderflower in as well, just so uh, I've done that. I can do that um, as well to save me time uh, because we couldn't do the photography for the website because the elderflowers hadn't come out. So that's going to be done retrospectively. Now I'm using one of these bottles for one of the photographs and you can see if you're using this type of bottle or jar and you need to water bath it, just clip it down. You don't need to leave the, the top loose or anything. Clip it down and the pressure will be enough to force up and out through the cap. It will go out because it's under a, a higher pressure than the outside air and it won't come back in. And so once it's been water bathed, it will be sealed down 
and when you open it, it will ple uh, pop rather pleasingly. But the way to, to water bath with this type of bottle is to shut it down completely. So I'm going to put that one in the middle. You don't have to cover the tops of the bottles if you haven't got a tall enough pan. Uh, it's not essential as long as the contents are heated up enough. And you see, I left an air gap at the top, and we'll see when it's um, when they've been in there for about 20 minutes. But the juices, uh, the the elderflower juice and the and the fruit juices will have expanded and filled the bottle. I'll then tighten them down, and as it cools, it will shrink, and we'll get uh, a nice vacuum seal. That's what we're trying to achieve. I've made this table very sticky. <laughs> right. Um, no, Rachel, you can make, I did last year, I did a uh, pear, uh, pear cordial. Uh, so you could add apple into that. The pears have got a lovely flavour. I had lots of pears on my, my tree last year. And it sort of feels a bit sacrilegious to squash them all and cook them into cordial, but it's been delicious. So, um, and I'll maybe mention that again next week because the pears are um, appropriate for that. Um, so just try it. I mean, what's the worst? <laughs> if you don't like it or it doesn't taste super flavoursome, then, you know, just make a few bottles to start with and see if you like it. And if not, you know, don't make any more. <laughs> but um, Elizabeth says, does the water come up to the rim of the bottle or the neck? Not especially. I mean, it is in this instance because I've got quite a lot of water in there, but um, it doesn't have to. It, if it came up about two thirds, as long as you heat it uh, enough, it will be fine. Um, I know this doesn't sound scientific and precise, but if you heat it, once it starts to uh, bubble, which it is now, heat it for about 20 minutes and it should seal and be fine. And if it's, swell, if it's um, expanded and come up inside the bottle, then that's a good indication that it's got really, it's got hot enough to do that and it's hot enough to sterilize the contents. Uh, Harris says, if you're using a swing top bottle, how full do you fill it? Um, I usually, well, that one's got about an inch, about, what's that, two and a half centimetres to go. Um, that one may not come right up to the top of the bottle. But um, there's, a, there's a line on the bottle, and I usually fill it to where the line is. Because with those bottles, you've got the stopper which is quite deep. So if you fill it too full, you put the stopper in, clip it down and it all goes everywhere. So you, you just, it's sort of trial and error really. But there's, the, you know, the, you'll see when they're heated that they have full, how high they come up in the bottle. Uh, Brenda says she loathes elderflower, so do I, but my sister loves it. Can I do a fizzy one for her? I wouldn't, Brenda. I really wouldn't. Um, if you make the elderflower champagne, you into a whole different ball game. Um, it's so volatile. All that pollen we showed you, the natural yeast, you've got no way of controlling that. It's not like making wine where you put the yeast in, you know how much is in there and all the rest of it. You've got to put it into plastic bottles, which is a bit of a you know, Diana, um, I used to save like mineral water bottles to put it in the plastic ones. Uh, and you find you go out in the garage or somewhere, you have to keep it out in an outhouse because it, it might explode. And then, you know, the base of the bottles go, they've got those sort of little four little corners and it goes up in the middle. It, there would be so much pressure in there, it would actually push out the shape of the bottle and they've all fallen over. And we used to live in a property that had quite a long garden. And we opened one of these bottles and the, the spray, like a, like a champagne, went 
I went about 100 feet down the garden. Uh, and that was after two years. And I just find it too... I think it's too dangerous, really, to make. It is delicious, but you can get the same effect with the cordial plus fizz. Give her a bottle of Prosecco with it or a bottle of water with it. Um, and it doesn't take up as much room. You know, it's easier to store. You don't have to refrigerate it until you open it. And if you're making it, say, for a wedding or a party, a summer party, make it and use it. You don't have to water bath it. This only gives your uh, cordial a year's shelf life by water bathing it. Uh, if you're going to use it straight away, or if you, you know, in the old days when we used to have things like fates and parties outside, then um, you could just make it and use it and, uh, and enjoy it. I don't like things with perfumey flavours, I'm afraid, but I acknowledge that it's a, a miracle of nature that you can make something like that so easily and that so many people do enjoy. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm not... Um, trying to discourage people. So, oh yeah, tried to make elderflower wine. <laughs> yeah, and filled the airing cupboard with it. Yeah, well, it, it is a wonderful thing. But of course, when you're picking the flowers, you need to leave a few for the berries later in the year, which in my head are even more useful. This is, this is welcome froth after the winter and the rain and the cold and everything else. This is, this is a kind of, it, it represents summer, doesn't it? Everything exploding into life and, and, and uh, being fabulous and fresh and everything. So uh, let's embrace it. And um, you can see that the levels are starting to come up a bit. I'm just going to grab my tongs that I'll need. So, and this is such a simple process. It's really, uh, it's well worth doing. 20 minutes and you've got it for a year then. And if you're going to make a variety, you will want that versatility really. And you will want to know that it's safe. I'm just clearing the decks. Oh, Nikki, you made it with your granddad. That's a lovely memory to have. Um, Elizabeth says, can you add liquor to the cordial? Um, yeah, you can make actually an elderflower liqueur in a similar way to how we've done other ones, where you just soak the flowers in vodka for a couple of weeks in a jar, you know, our big, big old jars that we use for soaking all sorts of things. Uh, like we made uh, marmalade gin and things like that, just put the flowers, uh, I think uh, my, the recipes are on my recipe site. If you've got your phone, uh, you've got recipes at rosymakesjam.com. You can go on there, there's elderflower liqueur, and I can't remember from the top of my head, but I think you need about 25 flower heads put them in the jar, pour over your vodka, leave for a couple of weeks, and then add, make the sugar syrup, as we did with limoncello, and add the sugar syrup, uh, strain the flowers out, obviously, <laughs> and then add the sugar syrup in, and then you've got an elderflower liqueur. That would be the way to do it, really, um, I think, the more reliable way, because the vodka will preserve uh, the flower and the flavor and everything. Uh, I keep meaning to remind you about the recipe site. It's absolutely incredible, not because of the recipes. I mean, although they're nice and many of them are my own concoctions, uh, but because Trev built this fantastic calculator. So if you go on there and you haven't got the, the amount that the recipe says, you can put your amount in, whether it's grams or ounces, and it will rescale the whole recipe for you so you know how much to get of everything. Um, 
And I just think I haven't seen a recipe site like that. And I think it's amazing and especially useful for preserving because of course we often do have different amounts because somebody gives you a bag of something. It's not necessarily what the recipe amount is. And then you're sort of there with a bit of paper trying to work it all out. So do use it uh, as much as you can. And if you're out and about and you see a bargain, get the site up on your phone and you can see how much you're going to need or if you know you can you can work it all out uh, somebody's making yeah we put the elderflower liqueur recipe up uh, somebody's making who's that Karis is making elderflower vinegar which is lovely and yeah uh, oh you found the calculator that's good <laughs> Um, and uh, so that's great. So you know it works and it's useful. So if you see, uh, you know, a whole box of, uh, Joe's patting himself on the back. Um, if you see a whole box of, say, plums later in the year, as you often do at people's gates or on a market, and you think, oh, I don't know how much sugar I need, you can put the amount of the plums in. You can get the sugar before you go home. You can make sure you've got enough jars for what you want to do. And off you go. You can do it all in one trip rather than getting home with the fruit and then having to go out again. So um, simple thing. I mean, it's not simple to do, but it's a simple resource, which is absolutely great. Now, I was going to talk about what I was going to talk about while this was cooking. But of course, I've been busy talking about something else. So I'll get these out and you can see... Uh, what I mean, uh, I think they're all okay. Not so much the clip top one, but I'm not too worried about that. that that's an acting bottle, you know, that's for the photography. So I'm not too worried, uh, you know, about keeping it for the seal. I'll probably give it to the photographer, to be honest. She usually keeps, I take the things around for them to be in the photo shoot and then she keeps them. She's got a little girl, so they enjoy it. So. I'm using my jar tongs, which are really for um, when I'm using the canner, but I find them invaluable for doing this job. Before, I used to have a, my, a tea towel wrapped around my hand, trying to grab it this out of boiling water. It's not great. So this shape at the bottom grabs either the jar or the bottle and lifts it safely out like that. And you can see if Trev scoops down that the cordial is raised up in the bottle. And I'll just will grab a tea towel to hold it. While I what you have to do now is to tighten up the caps straight away, otherwise they won't be airtight. So just tighten them up, give them a bit of a wipe, and then leave them be just so that the seal gets a chance to, to seal. And then as we're I'm talking uh, while we're doing the next bit, you'll probably find it's dropped back down again. There's two there. Obviously, I'm not put even heat on the hot plate. I'm going to leave. There's two or three. I'm going to leave in for a bit longer. But you get the gist. Do these two up. I'm going to move those over there. I'm going to bring in my other bits of kit. I just want to talk about and tell you what they are. So my American friends will uh, recognise this immediately. Okay, these sorts of methods are fairly uh, young, shall I say. 
Sorry, I'm going to push those off the table, aren't I? I'm not careful. So, um, we were talking about apple juice earlier. Um, and we use an electric juicer. We've got an eating apple tree and we've got two cooking apple trees. So I use the, neither of us eat apples as apples much. Um, so we, but we do love apple juice. So we juice the apples just as juice. We don't dilute it or ferment it or anything. And then we bottle it and we sterilize it. Now, if we were to do this sort of sterilizing with a whole tree's worth of apples, then it's not a very big tree, but there's a lot of apples. So, you, you know, we'd be here forever. So we use the electric steriliser. It does the same job, except that it's temperature controlled and it has a timer as well, which is invaluable because you can load it up and you can leave it and then it will switch itself off. You can come back and take the bottles out, do up the caps and you haven't got to sort of watch it every five minutes. Just showing you the controls there at the front. You also see a tap. So if you did that and you, you had a bigger press, because you can get all sorts of juice presses, you know, ones that look like old barrels with a screw top or there's a lever that squashes it down. Um, there's all kinds of presses. You could press all the apples and get the juice and pour it straight into the steriliser. You can turn it on and do the timer and all that sort of thing. And then at the end, you bottle it into the bottles through the tap and do up the cap straight away. You don't have to then re uh, sterilize it. You just, as long as your bottles are warm, you put the hot juice in and you do them up straight away, it will have the same effect. But in that case, it's like the jam, you fill it right to the top because you, you're not driving any more air out. You need to do up the cap and let it shrink down uh, as it cools, and then um, it will be safe. And it will keep, again, you've got a shelf life of about a year. And the apple juice is lovely. It's naturally sweet. It's a beautiful, well, our apples are a beautiful tawny color. Um, we don't make cloudy apple juice. It's a clear tawny color. And then if I show you the inside, you can see um, the bottles stack up on the um, plastic rack at the bottom so they don't all clatter about on the um, piece of kit. This is sort of enamel. Uh, if you're doing um, bottled fruit and that kind of thing, you can put the, the um, clip top jars in or the screw top jars. You can put those in and you can put one layer on top of the other if you're just water bathing and then and do it for the time that you need to do it all that kind of thing and just leave it and it's it's i use this a lot uh, i find it very convenient i'll move it out of the way you can also use it if you're having um the elusive fate which we can't have at the moment much um you can use it for hot drinks, but I have never have, and I don't think I would, because if I did want it to use it for juice, I wouldn't really want it to smell of coffee, to be honest. So I don't do that. Um, and this is the pressure canner, which our American friends will recognize. It's the Presto pressure canner. Um, and this is for, it's like a big pressure cooker, and it's for, pressure canning acid, low acid vegetables and fruits and meat and soup and things like that. So it's not safe to water bath those kinds of things and just sterilize them like we're doing tonight. You must have the addition of the pressure. The pressure that builds up increases the temperature by, I think it's 13 degrees which means that not only are yeasts and molds destroyed, but bacteria as well. So if you want to do things like, you know, diced chicken or a stew or all those kinds of things, I do lots of bolognese or 
uh, those kinds of things that I can then I do a sort of bolognese general mix, which I can then use either as a cottage pie or bolognese or put chili beans with it. You know, I can mix and make different meals from the same base. Um, and I'm by no means adventurous, <laughs> but I'm, you know, it's very, very useful for that. It's a similar idea. You've got the lid that comes off. You've got the uh, base that you stand all your um, clip top jars or your screw top jars on and you can stack them up. Uh, you can only fill it two thirds full. This is the one I use, so it's, um, you know, looks used. And then you've got a gauge at the top for the pressure. Now, Presto no longer sell what's called, um, it's a, a, a weight that goes on here. What I've got is, this is just closes the unit down to create the pressure, but the, um, you can get a weight that goes on there so you don't use the gauge. But it's not possible to buy those because uh, the people who live at different sea levels have to adjust the pressure differently. And if you just put a weight on that seals it, you haven't got that. Um, you haven't got that ability. Uh, it takes about 75 minutes to do most sort of meat, that kind of thing, from raw. Um, which sounds like a long time, but actually, you know, it's useful because you've then got meals on the shelf, they're completely shelf stable, uh, and you can do uh, low acid fruits like uh, beans and vegetable mixes. Uh, I did a whole load of um, baked beans from haricot beans the other day. I made, uh, you know, like a like a baked bean um, dish with bacon and that sort of thing. Um, I don't have a class in the preserving school specifically for this, but if you want me to, later on in the year, um, I may, you know, if you, want to, if you want to know more about the different things you can do, I can do it like we did the dehydrating class as a, diff, as a class between the terms, if you see what I mean, but just let me know. Um, but it's a useful bit of kit, useful bit of preserving. If you're approaching um, preserving from a, a, I wouldn't say survival, but you know what I mean. If you're trying to be self-sufficient and you need a sort of, you're, you've got a sort of homesteading approach, then it's a very useful piece of kit. Uh, we don't have a, a commercial kind of, um, approach to this in this country and as much as artisans generally speaking don't uh, pressure plant food to sale but it's very much a, a homemade scenario and it's a very valid one these days as our shelves empty in the supermarkets because of Brexit so um, you know it's uh, just another aspect I thought I'd show you Unfortunately, though, it's not the kind of thing I can show you in a class because it, it would, it's just too long, start to finish, really. Uh, how do I juice the apples? I just, we've got an electric juicer, we put them through. It's a bit torturous because that's really meant for juicing things that you, you have in a glass and drink, you know, uh, making a, a, a fresh juice. But uh, we do do it. But I might think about getting a bigger. There's all if you just Google uh, fruit presses, yeah, yeah, it could become your new hobby. You know, there's loads of different ones to choose from uh, that various people sell, and it just depends what where you want to use it. I mean, I'm thinking it's going to be much much better to do the juicing outside because it is a bit messy, um, and then you can deal with all the pulp outside but having to carry it through the house um, and because all you end up with in actual fact is skin and cores really squashed so it, I don't think there's anything that's of much use really after you juice so it goes on the compost um, but if you're serious about it there's all different different ways of doing it um, but maybe because uh, this is raw juice, you know, you don't cook it other than sterilizing it. So you're not, it's not like cooking fruit down and then straining it. This is just 
four straddles. So, you know, maybe if you could borrow a juicer or something, and see if it's something that you'd like to do. I'm going to take those out in a second. As Tracy says, she's got a wooden press and it works very well. I was looking at those today, actually. And they're, they're kind of quite homely, you know, they look quite, they're very simple. <coughs> it's sort of like a bucket with a big handle on the top that just squashes it down. Or it's got a screw with a winder and a plate that squashes it down. Um, and you can get them all different sizes. You can get electric ones, you can get huge great ones if you want to go into making cider and that sort of thing. Um, who knows uh, where it will lead? But you know they're not they're not fiercely expensive. So if you fancy it, you know I think I think the one I saw that was a sort of moderate size and simple. It was a, um, it wasn't electric. It was a, uh, I was looking at the the French site that I used for that kind of thing because we don't have a lot of British choice really. But I think it was about eighty euro, about eighty. So it's around eighty pounds. Um, I don't know what that is in dollars off the top of my head, but you know, it's not eye watering if you're serious about it and you've got fruit trees. You don't have to just do apples, of course. Right, so I'm going to turn this off and take the rest out and do them up. And then we're done. If anyone's got any more questions, Brenda, uh, well, Carol says, I've Never made it before, it's cordial, but I've made jam. Oh, that's the um, raspberry and... Uh, when I make raspberry and rhubarb jam, I use equal proportions, and it's absolutely lovely. So I guess cordial would be the same. Um, you know, just use... But you can use the rhubarb as a sort of bulking fruit because it's cheaper and put some raspberries in for the flavour, you know, just whatever you've got, really. Um, Brenda says they live in an old orchard, so have a few apple trees in the garden, but like you, don't actually like apples to eat very much. Yes, yeah, cider, that's the way to go. <laughs> you can, of course, as well, from the, if you've got lots of peel and cores, you can just put them in a, in a bucket or a wine-making bucket and put the lid on and make your own vinegar. A very simple vinegar which um, you know is useful. I wouldn't use it for preserving but it's certainly useful especially if you want to use it for cleaning and that sort of thing. It just turns itself into vinegar. You don't have to do anything to it other than leave it <laughs> like a lot of preserving. Oops that's not going to work. That's too small for that. So back to the tea towel. Take that one out. There we are. I didn't fill that one quite high enough to look for it to come up to the top, but it's had plenty of time in there. And it's 20 minutes. So I hope you have a go at those and try them out. And of course, when you've made the cordial, you don't have to just drink it. You can make sorbets with it. You can mix it to make ice cream. Um, you can use it as a sauce, all kinds of things. So. Um, and ice lollies as well, of course. Um, you can make delicious ice lollies with it, either ice lollies for children, or you could make grown-up ice lollies with um, some booze in them, maybe. Not too, not vodka and things like that, though, because it won't freeze. But you know, you could, um, you know, experiment with that. And you know, maybe some of the edible flowers in as well would look pretty. And the if you use the elderflower, you know, not use the elderflowers, but just some spring flowers or, um, you know, like they've got on the front here, they look very well together. I mean, that's not an ice lolly, but um, you get the gist. And uh, food for thought again. <laughs> So I hope you'll give that a go and enjoy it when you've made it and, and make some through the seasons and then you have a whole variety of ones to choose from. You know, you won't get bored just drinking a, a, a luminous yellow orange squash or something. You'll, you'll have your own delicious cordials that you can use in all sorts of ways. So next week we are doing, uh, we're making red currant jelly. And again, I should be using frozen red currants. I 
either I haven't got many red currants this year or the blackbird's eaten them all already. So either way, I've got some frozen ones, which are fine. We're going to be doing the same kind of process where they need to be cooked down and strained. So um, it's the same sort of same sort of process, but we'll go through some other things as well on the evening. So have a good week and I'll see you next time.